Before you is a list of four limit identities that seem relatively obvious but may take a little bit of time to prove rigorously. So for the first part, we would use epsilon deltas to prove several limits involving zeros in a relatively easy manner. We say that a function has limit zero as t approaches zero precisely when, for any output threshold epsilon, you can find an input threshold hold delta such that when the inputs are constrained by delta, the outputs are constrained by epsilon. And we would say that the function f has a limit l as x approaches c precisely when this modified function has limit 0. So using this definition of a limit at 0 being equal to 0, we claim that if two such functions behave this way, when you add these two functions, their limit at 0 is still 0. So we fix an epsilon bigger than 0, and we would upper bound f plus g via the absolute value of f plus the absolute value of g. The question then reduces us to wondering, can we upper bound each of these terms by epsilon over 2? Well, let's recall that the limit of f at 0 is 0. And since epsilon over 2 is a positive number, we can find an input threshold delta 1 such that when the inputs are constrained by delta 1, the modulus of f is upper bounded by epsilon over 2. But since the limit of g at 0 is 0 as well, and epsilon over 2 is a positive number, we can find an input threshold delta 2 such that when the inputs are constrained by delta 2, the outputs are constrained by epsilon over 2. Now we aim to prove that the limit of f plus g at 0 is 0. This means that we need to show that for any epsilon bigger than zero, we can find a suitably chosen input threshold delta. So we're going to choose delta to be the smaller of delta 1 and delta 2. This means that when the inputs are constrained by delta, we can upper bound the absolute value of f plus g via the absolute value of f plus the absolute value of g. And since delta is not more than delta 1, f is upper bounded by epsilon over 2. But since delta is also not more than delta 2, g is also upper bounded by epsilon over 2. Combining these output thresholds, we obtain the output threshold epsilon, which is precisely what we wanted to show. We can do something similar if the limit of f at 0 is 0, and we multiply it by some non-zero scalar k. We're going to fix an output threshold epsilon and express the absolute value of kf as the k times f. Would it be possible to upper bound f with epsilon over k? Well, we know the limit of f at 0 is 0, which means that for the output threshold epsilon over k, there is an input threshold delta such that when the inputs are constrained, f is upper bounded by epsilon over k. So now we need to establish the limit identity of kf at 0 being equal to 0. This means that for any epsilon bigger than 0, we need to find an input threshold delta such that we get our desired outcome. Well, we know that the modulus of kf is the modulus of k times the modulus of f. And we know that when the inputs are constrained, the modulus of f is constrained by epsilon over k. So we are left with epsilon, which is precisely what we wanted to show. But let's be even more ambitious. Let's say that the limit of f at 0 and the limit of g at 0 are both 0. Then what happens when we find the limit of fg at 0? Well, that should be equal to 0. Let's fix the output error threshold epsilon. Could we upper bound each of these terms by the square root of epsilon? Well, since the limit of f at 0 is 0, and since square root of epsilon is positive, we can find an input threshold delta 1 such that when the inputs are constrained by delta 1, f is constrained by the square root of epsilon. But similarly, the limit of g at 0 is 0, which means that for the positive error threshold, the square root of epsilon can find an input error threshold delta 2 such that g is constrained by the square root of epsilon. To ascertain that this limit identity holds, we need to show that for any epsilon bigger than 0, we can find an input threshold delta that satisfies our needs. Let's choose delta to be the smaller of delta 1 and delta 2. Then we can constrain the inputs to delta and write the absolute value of f times g as the absolute value of f times the absolute value of g. Since delta is not 
lot more than delta 1, f is upper bounded by the square root of epsilon. And since delta is not more than delta 2, g is upper bounded by the square root of epsilon. As required. Now we recall that the limit of the function at 0 is L precisely when the limit of the modified function at 0 is 0. So we now claim that if f has a limit of 1 at 0, then 1 over f has a limit of 1 at 0 as well. To prove this, let's fix an output error threshold epsilon and we can rewrite the absolute value of 1 over f minus 1 and we want to upper bound these terms so that we obtain epsilon in the end. Is this possible? Well, we know that the limit of f at 0 is 1. For the output error threshold a half, there is an input error threshold delta 1, such that when the inputs are constrained, the outputs are constrained by a half. Doing a bit of algebra, we obtain that 1 over f is upper bounded by 2. But similarly, the positive error threshold epsilon over 2 has an input error threshold delta 2 such that when the inputs are constrained, the outputs are constrained by epsilon over 2. So using this information, we want to establish that the limit of 1 over f at 0 is 1. We want to show that for any epsilon bigger than 0, we can find a delta bigger than 0 that satisfies our requirements. Let's choose a delta to be the smaller of a delta 1 and delta 2. Then constraining the inputs to delta, we can rewrite the absolute value of 1 over f minus 1 in terms of the two terms we intend to upper bound. And since delta is not more than delta 1, we know that 1 over f is bounded above by 2. But since we also know that delta is not more than delta 2, f minus 1 is upper bounded by epsilon over 2, which is what we needed to prove the limit. Now that we've done all of the hard work, we can now obtain some free limits at 0. We recall that the limit of f at 0 equals L precisely when the limit of f minus L at 0 equals 0. This means that if f has limit L and g has limit m, then f plus g must have a limit L plus m. To see this, since f has limit L, f minus L has limit 0. And since g has limit m, g minus m has limit 0. But since these two functions have limit 0, the limit of the sum must equal 0. We can shuffle the terms with a little bit of algebra, and using this original definition, f plus g has limit l plus m. What about scalar multiplication? Since f has limit l, f minus l has limit 0. And since this function has limit 0, multiplying it by k also causes it to have a limit of 0. Distributing the k into the brackets, by the definition, this means that kf has limit kl. These two results surprisingly actually help us prove that if f has limit l and g has limit m, then f minus g has limit l minus m. We can write f minus g as f plus the negative of 1 times g. We can bring the limits into the sum, we can pull out the multiple, and since adding negative 1 simply refers to subtracting, we can replace the limit of f with l and the limit of g with m. And that is the proof that the limit of f minus g must equal to l minus m. But what about multiplication? Since f has limit l, f minus l must have limit 0, and since g has limit m, g minus m must have the limit 0. But since these two functions have zero limit, their product also has a zero limit. Expanding the terms on the inside by algebra, we can distribute the limit across the terms, and we can pull out any constant. And since the limit of f is l and the limit of g is m, we can do a bit of algebra, but bringing the lm over to the left side completes our result. But does this work for division? In other words, if the limit of f is some non-zero l, is the limit of 1 over f equal to 1 over l? Well, since f has limit l, if we divide f by l, the limit gets divided by l as well, giving us a limit of 1. But from the previous result, when we flip the l and the f, the new function still has limit 1. This means we can divide by l throughout both sides and obtain the limit of 1 over f equaling 1 over l. This now helps us prove that if f has limit l and g has a non-zero limit m, then the limit of f over g is precisely l over m. f over g can be written as f 
times 1 over g. But we know that the limit of the product is the product of the limits. And since f has limit l and g has limit m, we can replace this with l times 1 over m. This gives us some free limits in general, because we know that the limit of f at c is precisely the limit of f of c plus t at 0. This means that the limit of the sum must be the sum of the limits. We can use the definition to write this as the limit of the sum at 0. But we have seen that the limit of the sum at 0 is the sum of the limits at 0. But by the definition once again, these are simply the limits at C. The limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. Because the limit of the difference at C is the limit of the difference at 0. But the limit of the difference at 0 is the difference of the limits at 0. And the limits at 0 are simply the limits at C. Similarly, the limit of the product is the product of the limits. The limit of the product at C is the limit of the product at 0, which equals the product of the limits at 0, which equals the product of the limits at C. The limit of the quotient at C is the quotient of the limits at C because the limit of the quotients at C is equal to the limit of the quotients at 0. But this equals the quotient of the limits at 0, which equals the quotient of the limits at C. These all hinge on the crazy calculus hack that you can learn more in this video here.